Okay, something is up. First and foremost, Jimmy Apple's Twitter troll extraordinaire says, let me play a video game of my VO3 videos already. Google cooked so good. And then he asked Logan Kilpatrick from the Google team, playable world models when. Demi Hassabis jumps in, which I don't think anyone quite expected, and says, now wouldn't that be something? Which feels like a reference. Doesn't that feel like a reference? Wouldn't that be something? It's a reference. So Demis was making a reference to Tron Legacy, but let's unpack what we're talking about here. So first and foremost, I have to agree, VO3 looks so good, especially at generating games, that would be incredible if you would be able to just generate your own video game worlds to play in on command. Now, by the way, it's pretty much an open secret that the Unreal Engine is used in a lot of different neural nets for training them to produce this sort of graphics. For example, Tesla, I believe at some point, was rumored to be using the Unreal Engine to simulate cars driving down the road and then to train the neural nets, the AI behind the self-driving cars on that. OpenAI's Sora was rumored to have used the Unreal Engine, which is kind of a 3D video game engine that's used to create graphics like this. Potentially, Sora used some of the outputs from the Unreal Engine to train their video model on. And certainly, there are tons of AI video where you enter a certain prompt and they display something for you. And you're like, that's a video game. You know what a video game looks like. And you can like safely say that that looks a lot more like a video game than it does real life footage. And certainly, if you wanted tons of synthetic data to train your AI models on, you know, using a video game or something like a 3D engine, certainly would be a great place to get it. Now, Google DeepMind has a lot of things where they combined AI in video games. We've covered Genie 2, an AI model that can create endless variety of playable 3D worlds, all from a single image. These types of large-scale foundation world models could enable future agents to be trained and evaluated in an endless number of virtual environments. And by the way, when they say playable, they, they mean playable. You're able to walk around, go back, forward, etc., jump. And this isn't a video game like we're used to. It's not code. This is generated by a neural net in real time. It looks at an image and then creates a world sort of from that image that you're able to interact with like a video game. You can kind of see it in these little animations. You can see what buttons are being pushed. So you want to go left, you push A, of course, on the WASD controls. There were other projects in which this one for 2D platform side scrollers. So if you're kind of like Mario or whatever, we are running in a 2D space and jumping over stuff. That could be created also from images with a neural network trained to do this thing. One of my personal favorites was, of course, Game Engine, which is, again, a neural net. There's no code here. Nothing is coded. This isn't Doom, although it looks a lot like it. So this is a game engine. It's a neural network, a neural model that is in real time simulating the game of Doom. It's kind of like when your brain has a dream and it sort of simulates you going about your business doing stuff. It's not actually happening. It's just sort of these visuals that this neural network creates as you're pushing the keys. So if you push the fire key, it knows kind of what's supposed to happen and it simulates what would happen on screen if you were to do that. If I recall the paper correctly, so this is done by one model, kind of the 3D space, and this is done by a different model The because the numbers have to be accurate. You can't just dream up numbers. It has to be a little bit more sort of concrete. But that's a game engine, and it's indistinguishable more or less from the real game of Doom, at least in when they were testing it with these players. They were only testing it for like these few second intervals. Obviously, if you play for too long, you're going to start seeing some artifacts and some glitchiness, if you will, some hallucinations. But it is able to stand up for a few seconds to where you really can't tell the difference unless you're looking really, really closely. You might be going, oh, that's weird. Google at DeepMind has a lot of video game projects that somehow overlap with AI. We're not even close to being done. Well, I take that back. We're, we're, we're almost done. But just one more thing. This is called SEMA. It's a generalist AI agent for 3D virtual environments. This thing apparently learned to play games like Satisfactory and No Man's Sky. And for some strange reason, Goat Simulator 3 also was included in there. I don't know why. 
the really big thing to understand here is this is probably very, very different from other AI agents playing video games that you've seen before, because here it's learning to play kind of by itself in real time using the controls that we as humans would use. So it's looking at the screen with vision, just like we would. It's not using any sort of uh, hooks into the video game's memory or anything like that. It's pushing the WASD keys to move around. It's using the mouse to look around. So it's interacting with this game in the same exact way that you and I would. And interestingly, it's learning to do these things from the players, kind of giving it a verbal command. So for example, in Minecraft, I might say, go collect to wood, at which point the AI agent would do what? Yes, it would go and punch a tree because that's how you get wood in Minecraft is you punch a tree. And over time, it starts to kind of categorize different abilities like using tools and objects and building and farming, combat, movement, driving, crafting, etc. So the goal is to build an agent that is able to respond to various verbal commands across basically any simulated world, any video game. You can take it from Minecraft to GTA to Helldivers 2, to whatever you want, and it would sort of have this general understanding of how to interact with things. By the way, this is from Genie, Google DeepMind's AI that just dreams up of video games. They say, we propose generative interactive environments, a new paradigm for generative AI, whereby interactive environments can be generated from a single text or image prompt. So why so much attention and resources are going into creating these video game worlds? We already have game making studios and making various games. Why do we need these neural nets to do it instead of the video game studios? By the way, Google is not the only one. Microsoft has their own version of this called Muse. Our first generative AI model designed for gameplay ideation. Notice to date, this is early 2025. Here, as you can see, they have various generated gameplay examples from a real game, but this AI model was trained on how this game would be played and then was able to kind of replicate it in real time. Last little detail to notice, notice while Demis is hinting at something, Logan Kilpatrick, again, he's the lead product for Google AI Studio. So he's kind of well known in the AI space. He's an insider at Google AI. He has a podcasts and he's been a lot of podcasts and I believe he's actually ex open AI if I recall correctly so somebody that kind of knows what's going on as you can see here his lips are shut if you can't tell this is an emoji with like a zipper going across the lips like it's I'm not saying anything so the point is Google is cooking something else behind the scenes that has to do with neural nets and video games. So why, for what reason, what is the ultimate goal? Well, there's some obvious answers to that and some not so obvious. You might recall Google had that Google Stadia project where it was kind of like a console that would stream video games. It was shut down in 2018, I believe. The idea was that instead of the game running on your local console, it would be streamed onto the device. So it'd be kind of generated elsewhere, but you, you just play it in real time. Again, I don't know too much about it. It was shut down. It's no longer available. But if I recall correctly, that was like the big idea behind it. So why is that relevant to what we're talking about? Well, one, if you're able to create a neural network that is able to just kind of stream in real time a video game, that opens up a lot of very awesome avenues for video game development. Potential benefits could be really low development costs. In regular video games, everything you see, everything that you interact with, everything that happens has been scripted by a software engineer. And I get that it's not always as scripted. There are random events, but those random events have still been coded by a human being. If you can have something that kind of just generates these games on the fly, probably an infinite amount of worlds. Number one, the cost per game or per experience would really plummet. A neural network would invent whatever was happening, would just imagine it, and the gamer would play the game in real time. It would also probably allow non-software developers to start dreaming up games by working with these neural nets, similar to how if you can't draw, you can produce you know, good AI art, or if you don't have a, any musical talent, you can still produce great AI music. With VO3, you can make 
great videos without any film making experience, it's not that much of a leap to think that in a few years we might be able to develop these games with no coding experience. And we wouldn't even have to code them. We would use one of these neural network approaches, maybe do a little sketch, say, make it look like this create rules like this, et cetera, and just dive in and start interacting with the world. The Microsoft project specifically talks about this as game development ideation, like quickly being able to sketch out, create worlds, test them out, see how they work. So just basically more opportunities, more creativity, more approaches to making these games, et cetera. So we're taking game development and making it easier for everybody and allowing us to create faster and better and just more stuff. And I'm sure we'll see this, but I don't think gaming is even kind of like the final destination for this sort of technology. I think really the final goal is to be able to run simulations and world models. In a video game, a lot of stuff is still deterministic. If we're able to create something like GTA 5, but instead of everything being coded, how it'd be a little bit more creative, run by a neural network we would be able to create millions of worlds, each with its own kind of living, breathing ecosystems. Those worlds would produce a lot of data. In the GTA world, you can, for example, get data about how cars drive around the city, data that can be used to train self-driving cars. Back in the world of Warcraft days, there was a bug that allowed this plague of some sort to spread between players and it was supposed to be contained to a dungeon but some players figured out how to extract it out of the dungeon basically make the entire world of warcraft as sick as this plague spread across every single player basically just killing everyone off interestingly later that event was studied by virology experts i guess they studied the spread of disease how it occurred in that virtual world it gave them actual data about how people might spread disease. If you saw that social simulacra paper out of, I believe it was Stanford, it simulated a little village and how people sort of transferred information, how different rumors and stuff like that spread across multiple people. Social simulations like that could be used by companies before rolling out certain policy changes to simulate how that could potentially maybe backfire or, or work correctly. Governments could use that to perhaps assimilate certain incentives that they're putting out there, tax breaks. And of course, just like the SIMA paper, we'd be able to train AI agents to navigate around the game. Imagine unlimited environments with different physics, with different obstacles, etc. This is something that Dr. Jim Fan from NVIDIA talked about. He basically said that eventually we might have sort of this one global universal agent for all of the different pieces of technology, all the robotics that we're going to have. At the end of the day, they might all be driven by just one model, the same model. This is a model that would be trained to basically play any video game from a flight sim to GTA to Minecraft to something underwater. It would be able to generalize so well between all those worlds that, you know, when it finally emerges out into the real world and is able to interact with real robotics here, for it, it would be just yet another video game, so to speak. It would just be able to generalize across all of those different realities, which is to say that if you think about it, this idea of building these, I mean, we say video game worlds, but actually you can think of them as 3D simulated worlds. There really doesn't seem to be an end to how much benefit we can gain from that. If we don't have to code up every single thing that's in that gaming world, like we do right now with video games, if all the visuals and physics and all the events that happen are sort of created by the neural net on the fly without us having to specifically say it has to do this or this or this, it just sort of gets how the physics works. It gets how buildings and cars and pedestrians work. That would open up a lot of opportunities for training AI agents, training robots, for running various scientific simulations within that world. And I think that's exactly what Demis is hinting at here, that something like that is in the works. And that we're probably going to see some of that pretty soon. And it's in the beginning, at least, going to look like a video game. It's probably going to be the function of it. It's going to allow us to play video games with it generated by the neural network or something along those lines. And it's funny to think about how AGI and most of the AI progress, a lot of it was built on the back of video games. Video games like Doom. Doom was initially created by one of the main developers was John Carmack. I wonder what he's up to now and what he would think about this. So that's John Carmack. He recently gave a talk about what he's trying to do with keen technologies. By the way, is it me or did, did he kind of get jacked? I feel like that's pretty jacked, right? I mean, by, by nerd standards, I think that qualifies. 
Anyways, he is working on AGI. His new approach that he describes here seems to be, in a nutshell, he's going to take robots, physical robots, and he's going to make them play video games. And here you can see the little setup. That's a little robotic camera. This is kind of the controller. So it's the Atari controller and kind of a robotic thing that is able to move the controller. So it's, it's, it's a physical thing. It's physically controlling the game. It's looking onto the screen. And the goal is to get it to generalize across different games so that if it learns to play Miss Pac-Man, for example, that should help it play some other game like Tetris or Space Invaders or whatever. So some of the brightest minds in AI, this is kind of where they're heading. Video games, 3D simulated worlds, and AI. Not only Demi Sasabis, but also Chad Carmack. Sorry, sorry, John Carmack. That's his name, John Carmack. But whatever the case is, it's interesting how when a civilization reaches a certain technological stage, it becomes really important to start running these 3D worlds, these simulations, if you will. Not ones that are hard-coded, but ones that are run on these neural networks where all the little players running around the little cities and sitting in their homes feel like they're real people and that they matter. You want them to think they matter so they contribute good data to the simulation. I just realized I'm wearing the same exact shirt that he is. Anyways, I think the point is that very soon, maybe in the next few decades, we will likely see some sort of a simulation built with these neural nets. It's obvious that this is a very valuable and it does seem like this is where a lot of these things are going. And when we do build a simulation, will it be the first of many? or just yet another one in a continuous chain. Stay tuned. My name is Wes Roth, and I'll see you next time.